Vegas team in. So we'll end up with heifers that have a bark of heifer, a bark of Brahmin, and have angus. Uh, and as, as uh, Jordan Thomas summarized well, there's a major difference between straight Bostaros cattle and Bostaros influence cattle. And one of the major differences between those cattle is their capacity and ability to reach puberty early in development. So we've done quite a bit of work trying to understand what are the mechanisms involved in that process and trying to, to use that knowledge to develop strategies to time puberty in, in Bosnian Indian influence heifers. So as my presentation outline today, I'll talk a little bit about the importance of time of puberty in replacement heifers. I'll go quick through this to not be repetitive, but I think we can emphasize enough how important it is for, for uh, beef cattle producers to have heifers that reach puberty early. I'm going to talk about some differences of straight Bostaros to Bosinicus, and when I mention Bosinicus again, keep in mind that I'm talking about Brahman influenced heifers, although similar uh, uh, process occur in the lower cattle uh, in Brazil. And then I'm going to talk about some strategies to, to overcome this difficulty of time in puberty in Bosinicus influenced heifers. So I'll talk specifically about nutritional strategies. I think earlier today was mentioned some good strategies of genetic selection between breeds for animals that reach puberty early. Also some important uh, hormonal protocols to induce puberty in heifers can be used. But again, those protocols need to be used in conjunction with good and adequate nutritional management. They cannot be used and be used uh, considered a substitute for adequate nutritional management. But basically, uh, what I'll be talking today about the strategies for nutritional programming of puberty. I'm going to talk a little bit about the hormones and neuroendocrine mechanisms involved in this process. I'm going to talk about timing. Uh, we talk a lot about target body weight at the first breeding season, and that's very important, but I'm going to present today the concept of timing uh, uh, during between weaning up until the first breeding season. Uh, there's some specific windows during that development where animals seem to be more responsive to the nutritional uh, stimulation of these animals. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Also going to talk about dietary energy sources. I'm going to talk about the difference between feeding heifers a high forage versus a high concentrate diet. And then we have the time towards the end. I'll talk a little bit about the interaction of pre and postnatal nutrition and pubertal development. So there's a new, relatively new topic called fetal programming. And it's this idea that if cows during gestation, depending on the nutrition of the cows, that those uh, those effects can those challenges during uh, fetal development can have long-term effects on the, on the calves that are born out of the Kita cow. So basically, if there's a drought or limited uh, nutrient availability <coughs> during pregnancy, try to understand a little bit about the long-term effects on the heifers that are born out of those cows. <coughs> so importance of the time of puberty, puberty on setting heifers. So it's estimated that roughly 4 million replacement beef heifers enter the U.S. cow herd annually. And life productivity of these animals is going to be heavily dependent upon their ability to reach early sexual maturation. So the goal for uh, replacement heifers is to be able to have their first calf as two years, three year olds or the second year of life. Although this is a, accomplished and achieved with most of these you know, producers in, in the central and northern regions of the U.S., unfortunately just a minority, just around 40 to 50 percent of beef producers in southern regions of the U.S. can meet this goal. And one of the main reasons for that is because of the Bosnian influence in most of, most of those herds. It's not only important for those animals to, to be able to breed during, uh, to have their first calf as two-year-olds, but it's also important for them to conceive during the first 21 days of the breeding season. So the earlier they will conceive during the first breeding season, the better chance they will have to rebreed. So we discuss about the challenges and, and, and difficulty of rebreeding first calf heifers. So it's very important that uh, these replacement heifers become uh, conceived early during the breeding season so that will give more time for the next breeding season for them to reestablish cyclicity and become pregnant. Again, a comparison of the heifers that uh, breed as two-year-olds versus three-year-olds, there's a, several economic analysis showing uh, the impact of that. And it's estimated that roughly the heifers that have their first calf as three year olds will, will produce approximately 300 pounds more of queen calf weight throughout their lifetime compared to uh, heifers that will have 
than three years of age. So uh, this is a, an attainable goal even for Gauzin to influence heifers. And as long as we can use some strategies, nutrition strategies in conjunction with some hormonal strategies, we, we can have a great majority of heifers uh, reaching that goal. To make things a little bit more complicated, not only do we need to have them uh, conceiving early during the breeding season, but many times the fertility for the first estrogen cycles during uh, when these animals reach puberty, the fertility is quite low. So it's important to have those animals to reach puberty even before the beginning of the first breeding season. So it's recommended the heifers will reach puberty around, should reach puberty around 30 days before the first breeding season. So by the time the breeding season starts, uh, they have maximum fertility uh, to conceive. And just a reminder, cows must win three to four calves to pay for their own development costs. So try to develop strategies that can increase the longevity of those animals in the herd is very important to be able to recover the costs that were uh, uh, spent on the development of those, of those animals. I won't talk much about this, but I, this slide is just to emphasize the importance of the brain regulating this process. So basically there's maturation of the hip reproductive neuroendocrine axis, so there's a specific region in the brain called the hypothalamus, and that region goes through a maturation as animals after weaning, as those animals start reaching uh, puberty. There's an increase in secretion of gonadotropin, so two important hormones, the follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So there's an increase in the number of pulses secreted from those hormones. Those hormones will act in the ovary and will stimulate follicular development and estrogen behavior. So that's when we start seeing heifers having mounting behavior because there's a stimulation of the brain through estradiol being secreted by the ovary. But more importantly, that increase in sterilogenesis from the ovary will act in the uterus and will change uh, some aspects of the uterus. So that's why it's so important to determine the reproductive tract score to be able to determine how much the uterus has been stimulated to those steroid hormones. And obviously when all this is accomplished, those animals will reach puberty and will gain the ability to become pregnant. So what are the main factors affecting sexual maturation in the heifer? So genetics is an important factor, so depending on the breed type and the mature body weight, that's going to have a, 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 a quite remarkable effect on the type of puberty. Pre and post weaning nutrition, so we're going to be discussing mainly about, about post weaning nutrition today, but there's a lot of studies uh, in the early 70s showing that pre-weaning uh, nutrition is very important for attainment of puberty in heifers. We're also going to discuss about the concept of critical body weight, adiposity, and nutritional increasing. So uh, although it's very important for heifers to reach a target body weight by the time they go to the first breeding season, we're going to discuss the concept of nutritional programming focused specifically in times of, of, uh, of development of those heifers. So in regards to genetics, there's several phenotypic differences between this group of Angus heifers compared to those Hereford heifers. Then when we start having some Bozinthus influence animals, for instance, with these Brangus heifers, or when we go straight to Brahmin heifers. And again, several differences from reproductive aspects of those animals. And one of the, one of the main differences is uh, their ability to reach puberty and the timing that they would spontaneously reach puberty. So this is showing the normal distribution of when heifers would spontaneously reach puberty if no nutritional imprinting or nutritional programming is proposed. So there's some major differences as we go from uh, Bostaurus breeds towards all the way to Bosinicus influence animals and obviously the animals with larger frames, animals uh, larger frame animals will reach puberty much later. And what is uh, quite frustrating is many times the Rosinicus influence heifers will have the size that is required for a healthy and safe, safe pregnancy way before they will reach that capacity to ovulate. So those animals already have adequate size, but many times they won't be having regular cycles yet. So to overcome that, we're gonna be talking about nutritional programming or nutritional Printing, which are some strategies to try to shift the distribution from time of puberty to the left, 
have those angles reaching puberty a little bit earlier, and also have a little bit more synchronized timing of puberty in those angles. So here's just to give an example of uh, different nutritional management of replacement heifers. And this is a typical operation in Texas. We're talking about, uh, you know, 1,200 pounds of mature cow, so it could be a brainless herd. So this is mature, uh, the average mature body weight of the, those cows, and again, it's important to weigh those cows, and there's quite a bit of variability on the, on the, on the weight of those cows. So in Texas, a lot of the breeding seasons will occur around April, so we're talking about a 60 to 70, uh, 75 day breeding season. So those heifers will be born somewhere around January until March. So in this example, the heifers are born in February. And typically, those heifers will be born around between six and nine months of age. So somewhere around November, most of those heifers will be weaned. For this first example, so the heifers are weaned with 600 pounds, and they're managed poorly from a nutrition standpoint. They just gain 0.4 pounds uh, uh, of uh, body weight gain per day. And they will start the first breeding season. By the time the first breeding season starts, when they're roughly 14 months of age, they'll have roughly 55% of the mature body weight. And that what will happen is majority of those heifers won't be cycling, won't be puberty by the time of the beginning of the breeding season. And either they will reach puberty throughout the breeding season, or even worse than that, they will be reaching attaining puberty after the end of the breeding season. So again, although there's some studies in most cattle heifers showing that developing heifers to 55% of mature body weight can be advantageous from an economic standpoint. We know with our experience with buzzing with those influence heifers and, and some previous studies showing uh, the practice rate in the first breeding season will be uh, negatively affected by that type of development. So we know that's not a good strategy for, for buzzing with the influence heifers. So we can develop those heifers a little bit different. So again, same weaning weight for those heifers being more uh, weaned with roughly 600 pounds. We can feed them uh, to gain roughly 1.2 pounds per day. So by the time they reach the, the beginning of the first breeding season, they will have to have roughly 65% of the mature body weight, or roughly 780 pounds. So what that, that will uh, induce is a shift to the left of the set of puberty. So we're gonna have those heifers reaching puberty a little bit earlier. We're gonna have roughly 20 to 30% of those heifers puberty before the first breeding season. And most of them will be puberty by the end of the breeding season. So the pregnancy rates by the end of the first breeding season be adequate, but it's important to remember that not only we want those heifers to become pregnant on that first breeding season, but we want them to conceive in the first 21 days. So all those heifers that are reaching puberty throughout the breeding season or during the breeding season won't be able to conceive in this first 21 days. So there's a higher risk of not being able to rebreed those heifers because they will end up calving later in the calving season. So what we're going to talk today is about this nutritional program or nutritional strategies to try to further shift puberty on such of the lab. So basically, in this case, the heifers will gain, again, on average, 1.2 uh, pounds per day throughout between weaning and the first breeding season, so similar rates throughout the period. But we're gonna focus on increasing nutrient availability in specific periods of grain of, of, of development of those animals. So we're gonna focus early after weaning to increase nutrient availability, and the idea is with you know, focus on specific periods we can further shift puberty to onset to the left, have majority of those heifers reaching puberty around 12 months of age. So by the time they start the first breeding season at 14 months of age, the great majority, if not all of those heifers, are puberty. So again, the goal for the nutritional program of puberty is to pro is, it, is nutrition programming to create a metabolic imprint during early to the now period at the hypothalamic level. So this explores and takes exploit the concept of brain plasticity. So when, when a baby is born, it starts developing. Many people say you've got to challenge the baby's early development because there's a lot of neurons and sonal projections being formed in the brain, and the brain is very plastic. So the same the same phenomenon occurs in heifers. So if we can change the metabolic status of those animals early in development, we can actually program how the brain is being formed. And that, as they become older, that system becomes less plastic and there's less opportunities to make those changes in brain development. And remember, the brain 
is the main organ that will regulate the time of puberty in, in these patterns. So these are some observations we had from, from early 2002 showing that as animals gain body weight and start getting closer from weaning to puberty, there's also an increase in a hormone called leptin. So leptin is a very important hormone that is secreted by the adipose tissue that actually travels to the brain and signals to the brain the amount of energy reserve that an animal has. So leptin will regulate appetite and satiety, so it's an important hormone that is quite discussed, particularly in obesity humans, because leptin has important uh, function regulating satiety centers in the brain. But more important for this aspect is leptin regulates the rate outgrowth. And what that means is leptin will regulate how the brain is going to be developed. So during development, changes in concentration of leptin will change on how the, those neurons in the brain will form, and that will lead to some permanent changes in the brain plasticity of those animals. So those changes will persist. And as the animals become old, the changes that occur early in development will persist for those animals. Leptin also has a permissive effect, so it allows for GnRH secretion. So if you fast an animal, leptin goes down and GnRH secretion decreases. If you give exogenous leptin to that animal, GnRH secretion goes back up. So it's a very, it has an important role of permissive factor for puberty. So it's required, the increase in leptin is required for animals to reach puberty. So we've done several studies using a similar model. So basically here on the left, we have the body weight gain from animals from those heifers. So those heifers were weaned early. So those heifers were weaned with roughly four months of age. They were adapted to a diet and they were fed to gain either one kilogram per day or half a kilogram per day until 14 months of age when the first breeding season would start. So we look at several physiological aspects to understand what are the differences that are going on with those heifers. Now surprisingly, we see an increase in the propanate to acetate ratio in the rumen, suggest, which is which is in line with when you feed a high concentrate diet to a heifer. But more importantly, is when we see those changes, we see several hormonal changes that we think are very important for time of puberty. So we we'll focus on three important hormones, insulin, IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1, and leptin. All those three hormones were elevated when the heifers were gaining body weight at higher rates. And we think those are very important hormones that will actually trigger the process of the pubertal onsetting heifers. Again, so this is the body weight of the heifers with a group gaining half a kilogram per day and another group gaining roughly one kilogram per day. And when we look at onset of puberty, we saw, and this was re repeated in several, several studies, we saw a high percentage of those heifers gaining one kilogram per day, reaching puberty around 10 to 12 months of age, whereas the heifers that gained just half a kilogram per day, just 50% of those heifers were puberty before the breeding season. So 50% of those heifers would enter the breeding season in a known puberty stage. So these were very important for us to understand a little bit about the physiological changes that occurred during puberty development. But from a practical standpoint, we want to learn a little bit more on when does this metabolic program of the brain occur. And more importantly, can we develop strategies, nutrition strategies that will time puberty while also optimizing other aspects of growth and development? Can we develop strategies to feed heifers where we can be economically efficient and also promote other changes in those animals that will be uh, favorable for other aspects of growth and development? So to do that, we did an experiment called a stair step study where we fed animals. To, we had four groups of heifers in this study. Again, those are heifers were weaned at four months of age, and we fed them from four months of age until the first breeding season, to 14 months of age. So we had two groups that I mentioned before, what we call the low gain heifers. So those heifers were eating a high forage diet to gain just half a kilogram per day or one pound per day throughout the development. We had the high gain diet, those heifers were fed a high concentrate diet to gain roughly two pounds per day or one kilogram per day. Again, from weaning all the way into the first breeding season. And I have, we had the, the stair step groups. These are the more important groups where we actually start with a group with, and these were group periods of 10 weeks during development. So from four to six and a half months of age, six and a half to nine, nine to 11 and a half, and then 11 and a half to 14 months of age. 
and they went through alternate periods of ad libitum intake of a high concentrated diet. So those heifers were supplemented with a high concentrated diet and ad libitum to gain roughly 1.3 kilograms per day or 2.5 pounds per day. And that's quite challenging to make a heifer gain 2.5 pounds per day. After that, we restricted the feed intake of those animals. So those animals were restricted for the next 10 week here. And then after that, they went through another compensatory period where they were fed a high concentrate diet again. So the objective of this was to diminish costs associated with feeding those heifers and also take advantage of these mechanisms called the compensatory growth, right? So when you restrict an animal and you transition them back to a high concentrate diet, they tend to compensate for that and they can gain body weight quite quickly. And we also had a second stair step, stair step group that went exactly through the opposite sequence. So those efforts were fed. They started the experiment with a, a low gain uh, here, then they went through compensatory gain, low gain, and then compensatory gain again. We look at changes in circulating concentration of leptin. Again, leptin, we believe, is one of the most important hormones that will trigger puberty. So we want to understand what those diets were doing to circulating concentration of leptin. As expected, the low gain heifers had low circulating concentration of leptin throughout the study. The high gain heifers, leptin increased as these animals accumulate energy reserves and at paucity, those animals start secreting more leptin and leptin went up. And with the stair step groups, we actually were pretty excited when we saw the data because we were able to create a peak of leptin in the first period when those animals were fed an ad libitum, a uh, uh, high concentrate diet and leptin went down after the, they were restricted. And we had similar finding with the stair step two again, with two different periods that leptin was peaking. So that would help us understand when during development that increase in leptin is important to trigger puberty in those heifers. So here's the cumulative percentage of animals that reach puberty, so the most important data. So it's expected a very low percentage of the low gain heifers reach puberty by the end of the study. So just to give a reference, by the time the breeding season would start right here, just 40% of the low gain heifers would be pubertal. When we fed them a high concentrate diet, 100% of those heifers were pubertal by 13 months of age. So that's really our target to have by 12 or 13 months of age, majority of those heifers being pubertal. But the most interesting finding here is with the stair step one, where we have the same high incidence of heifers reaching early puberty. So even though they go through a restriction, a period of restriction between six and a half and nine months of age, what this is telling us is if we feed them a high concentrate diet between four and six and a half months of age, we can program the brain, and even if we restrict them after that, they will still show the same high incidence of early puberty compared to the high concentrate diet. The stair step two was also very interesting where we don't see a severe, a severe effect on advancing puberty as we see with the stair step one and the high concentrate diet, but we see an advancement of puberty compared to the low gain uh, group. So obviously the question that from producers are, so do I need to win my heifers at four months of age? Is that a requirement? Do we need to win heifers at four months of age? Well, that's an important question. And uh, you know, just as a practical experience, heifers weigh very well at four, four months of age. They usually adapt quite quickly and they like to eat, so they will adapt well and, 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 and in a very healthy way. But what we see with the stair step two is even if we start later, the high concentrate diet, if we start just at six and a half months of age, we can still have, you know, quite reasonable results, right? With 90% of the heifers being puberty before the first breeding season. So, uh, but Based on these studies, we see two potential approaches. One, perhaps increasing nutrient intake of those heifers early development at four months of age to five months of age. However, another possibility would be to wean those heifers a little bit later and start feeding them a high concentrate diet, either through supplementation or in a feed yard, to be able to promote those metabolic changes and have a high percentage of those animals puberty by 14 months. Another important finding that we saw with the stair step one is res resulted in approximately 7% reduction in feed costs compared to a high concentrate diet. So again, we can induce a similar percentage of animals pubertal by 12 months of age, but we have a 7% reduction in, in feeding costs of those animals. And we haven't looked at lactation performance, but the 
important to mention that this model was actually developed from a model uh, that was proposed by Dr. Chen Park in North Dakota, where he shows that alternating the spirits of during the spirit development of alternating high concentrate diet to a low concentrate diet actually stimulates the development of the memory gland and can improve lactation performance of those animals. So, still has a, not only a potential to reduce development costs, but maybe perhaps increase other aspects of, uh, of, of lactation of those animals. Another question we ask is, is this associated with the rate of body weight gain, or is this associated with the actual diet that we fed those animals? And to answer that question, we did an experiment where we had four groups. We had, again, high gain animals and low gain animals. But within each one of those groups, we had animals that were gaining we were fed a high forage diet, we were fed a high concentrate diet. So we had two different rates of body weight gain, half and one kilogram per day, and we had two different sources of it, one with a high forage diet and one with a high concentrate diet. So if you look at the average daily gain as expected and designed, there's no difference between the animals in the low gain eating a high forage or high concentrate and in the high gain eating a high, uh, high concentrate or a high forage diet. However, one of the main important findings we saw in the study is when we look at those changes in hormones that are important triggers for puberty, we see that when we feed them a high concentrate diet in the purple line, we have this drastic increase in circulating concentration of leptin. However, when we promote a similar rate of body weight gain, feeding a high forage diet, we don't see those changes in circulating concentration of leptin. Unfortunately for this study, we didn't have enough number of heifers to look at a set of puberty to see if we would have any effects. But we really think that the lack of increase in latching on the high forage diet group would not allow for those animals to reach early puberty the same way we see with the animals fed a high concentrate diet. So what this is telling us is not only the rate of body weight gain is important, but a high concentrate diet will lead to those metabolic changes there are favorable for those animals to reach early puberty. And if you feed them to gain a high rate with a forage-based diet, then likely those effects are not going to be as severe as we see with a high concentrate diet. I'm going to talk quickly about this concept of uh, prenatal programming. So we're starting to look at some of the interaction of prenatal and postnatal nutrition. So again, it's this idea that if during gestation cows go through some limited nutrient intake, you know, for drought conditions, some other conditions that will lead to decreased feed intake, they could, those could have long-term effects on the offspring of those animals. So in this design, we had basically three groups of cows uh, during gestation, cows that were fed, uh, what we call the control animals at five, uh, what I call just four at five throughout gestation, and then the cows that were restricted during the last two-thirds of gestation to go to a body condition score of three, and cows that were uh, fed a high concentrate diet to gain body weight and, and, and have this obese phenotype of a body condition score of seven and eight uh, throughout the two-thirds of, of gestation. So here's the data of body weight of those animals at body condition score, just showing that we were able to create this nice contrast uh, in these animals throughout gestation. And then what we did is the heifers that were born out of those cows, we put them in the similar model that I showed before. Again, either to maintain a high gain uh, rate or a low gain rate. Uh, again, an interaction, a three by two factor. So we had you know, heifers that were fed you know, from the three groups of cows in both groups, either to gain high gain or a low gain rate. And this is an ongoing experiment. We haven't uh, finished analyzing all the data. And just as a summary, we look at a lot, we have, don't have purity data on those animals yet, but we've done quite a bit of studies looking at the brain development of those animals. And what it, so far what our data indicates is there's some changes in brain development that occurs during fetal life that will persist postnatally. And unfortunately, those changes seem to, be, to indicate that nutrient restriction during gestation will be detrimental to the ability of those heifers to respond to this nutritional imprint. So even though heifers respond to the nutritional imprinting most of the time in a favorable way, if there is a decreased nutrient availability during fetal development, the ability of those animals to respond can be uh, decreased. More important than that is the changes in the brain that we see in those animals are not only important for puberty development, but they're also important for regular astrocyclicity. They're also important for those animals to establish cyclicity during the 
part of the Earth. So we really believe that uh, changes during gestation of nutritional availability during gestation can have long-term effects on the offspring. And we are, there are several groups studying that and we're starting to, this is a relatively new concept, we're starting to learn a little bit more of what are the long-term impacts of those changes in, in nutrient availability uh, during gestation. So as a summary, nutritional acceleration of puberty, so when we subject animals to those the nutritional we see several alterations in the neuroendocrine system. So when we look at the brain of those animals, there's several changes in the brain suggesting that we will feed a high concentrate diet to those animals. There are several changes that are favorable for the attainment of puberty in those heifers. Uh, there is a period of neuroplasticity or brain plasticity early development, particularly between four and eight months of age, and that's probably the window of development of replacement heifers that we should try to exploit. And again, we can develop some of the approaches, for instance, the stair step approach, that take advantage of this period of brain plasticity to try to program the brain in time period in heifers. And this can have also some economical benefits and also uh, um, perhaps improve other aspects of development of those animals, for instance, increasing lactation performance in those heifers. Another topic that we, we need to study is, is again, this prenatal perturbations or changes in nutrition during prenatal development we really need to understand a little bit better of what the long-term impacts are and develop some recommendations for producers in case cows lose body conditions for during pregnancy, what the, what the long-term impact will be for, for the offspring. So there's this important rule of, rule of thumb and dogma in the field that puberty will occur in both infants heifers when heifers reach 65% of the mature body weight, and there's still a good rule of thumb. However, there's several factors that will dictate whether that will uh, occur or not. So one of the factors obviously is genetics. So while this can be uh, quite consistent in both taurus heifers, for instance, a group of Angus heifers, we can be uh, more confident about the puberty status of those heifers as long as they reach the 65% mature body weight. It can definitely not, it would be not recommended to try to estimate uh, the status, the puberty status of both infants heifers just based on body weight of those animals. That's why it's so important to determine the reproductive tracks, track score of those animals to have an idea whether those animals are puberty or not. It's not unusual to have heifers with over 800 pounds and when you go palpate them you can believe how small their reproductive tract is. So it's very important to, to palpate those animals because trying to, to estimate this based on body weight can be quite uh, deceiving. It will not only depend on the genetics, but it will also depend on the timing of body weight gain. So, as I mentioned, if that, if, even though animals reach 65% of their mature body weight by the first breeding season, the percentage of the animals that will be puberty by then will depend on when that body weight gain occurs. So, if it occur right after weaning, between four and eight months of age, there's a, a higher likelihood that those animals will be puberty. However, if they gain that body weight later during development, um, the chances of having a high percentage of those heifers puberty by the breeding season uh, are going to be smaller. So it's very important to monitor body weight gain uh, between weaning and the first breeding season in these heifers. It also seems to depend on the diet. So although body weight per se is very important, it seems that the energy source in the diet, so if it's a diet with high starch content, for instance corn silage, seems like the beneficial effects on advancing puberty are going to be more drastic than those seen when the heifers are developed on a forage-based uh, type of diet. So even though body weight in general is important, the source of nutrient uh, seems to be important and the effects of a high concentrated diet seem to be more, uh, more severe than the effects that we see with a high forage diet. And finally, it also will depend on what they've been exposed to innately. So we have quite a bit of studies going on trying to understand some of that but we have some preliminary data that really suggests that even though those animals can respond to this nutritional imprinting, depending on what happens during prenatal life of those animals, they might not be able to respond, not to the same extent that the control animals would respond to that nutritional program. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people that were, were involved in these studies and, and obviously the USDA for, for funding these studies, and I'll be happy to, to take any questions.